Barukata Dunai, Elohenu Melakalam, Asher Bakar, Benu Mikoha Amin, Benatan Lanu et Tarato, Barukata Adonai, Notain Ha Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who chose us from all the peoples and gave to us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and uh, open up our Bibles to the Mead Bar, Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to read 1 through 4. Then the Lord spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai, in the tent of meeting on the first of the second month in the second year after they come out of the land of Egypt, saying, Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel, by their families, by their fathers' households, according to the number of names, every male head by head, um, head by head, from 20 years old and upward, Whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. With you, moreover, there shall be a man of each tribe, each one head of his father's household. Then let's go down to verse 17, 17 to 19. So Moshe and Aaron took these men who had been designated by name, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first of the second month. Then they registered by ancestry in their families, by their father's households, according to the number of names, from 20 years old and upward, head by head, just as the Lord had commanded Moshe. So he numbered them in the wilderness of Sinai. Then dropped down to 44 Verse 44. These are the ones who are numbered, whom Moshe and Aaron numbered with the leaders of Israel, 12 men, each of whom was his father, was his father's household. So all the numbered of Israel of his uh, sons of Israel by their father's households from 20 years old and upward, whoever was able to go out to war in Israel, even all the numbered men. Uh, were 603,550. Okay. Um, the Levites, however, were not numbered among them by their father's tribe, for the Lord had spoken to Moshe, saying, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not number, nor shall you take their census among the sons of Israel. Verse 50. But you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony and over all the furnishings and over all that belongs to it. They shall carry the tabernacle and all its furnishings, and they shall take care of it. They shall also camp around the tabernacle so that the tabernacle is to set out. So when the tabernacle is to set out, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle encamps, the Levites shall set it up. But the layman who comes near shall be put to death. The sons of Israel shall camp, each man by his own camp, and each man by his own standard, according to their armies. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony, so that there will be no wrath on the congregation of the sons of Israel. So the Levites shall keep charge of the tabernacle of the testimony. Thus the sons of Israel did according to all which the Lord had commanded Moshe. They did. Then chapter 2, 1 through 3. Now the Lord spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying, <clears throat> The sons of Israel shall camp each by his own standard. With the banners of their father's household, they shall camp around the tent of meeting at a distance. Now those who camp on the east side toward the sunrise shall be of the standard of the camp of Judah by their armies and the leader of the sons of Judah. Nakshon, the son of Aminadav. Okay. And then let's uh, jump down to verse 32 to 34. These are the numbered men 
of the sons of Israel by their father's household, the total of the numbered men of the camps by their armies, uh, 603,550. The Levites, however, were not numbered among the sons of Israel, just as the Lord had commanded Moshe. Thus the sons of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moshe. So they camped by their standards, and so they set out, every one by his family, according to his father's household. And now chapter 3, verse 40. Um, the Lord said to Moshe, number every firstborn male of the sons of Israel from a month old and upward and make a list of their names. You shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel and the cattle of the Levites and instead of all the firstborn among the cattle of the sons of Israel. So Moshe numbered all the firstborn among the sons of Israel, just as the Lord had commanded him, and all the firstborn males by the number of names from a month old and upward, for they numbered men, for the numbered men were 22,273. Then the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the sons of Israel, and the cattle of the Levites, and the Levites shall be mine. I am the Lord. For the ransom of the 273 of the firstborn of the sons of Israel, who are in excess beyond the Levites, you shall take five shekels apiece per head. You shall take them in terms of the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 garas. And give the money, the ransom of those who are in excess uh, among them to Aaron and to his sons. So Moshe took the ransom money from those who were in excess beyond those ransomed by the Levites. From the firstborn of the sons of Israel, he took the money in terms of the shekel of the sanctuary, 1,365. Then Moshe gave the ransom money to Aaron and his sons at the command of the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moshe. All right, the prayer after the reading. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melach HaOlam, Asher Natan Lanu Tarat Imet, Behae Olam Natah Ketanu, Baruch Atah Adonai, Natan HaTorah. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Amen. All right. All right. Let's take out our notes here, and we're going to start in uh, chapter one. Number. Numbers chapter one. Make sure everybody's muted. Yeah. Okay. All right. The Roman numeral two in your notes here. The mead bar actually means in the wilderness. When you put a B, a bet, in front of, or the bet is either the bet or the vet. It's either the B or the V. It, it can go either way. So when you put a bet in front of a word in Hebrew, it means in, okay? So, um, B'Shem, Yeshua, in the name of Yeshua, right? So, uh, better sheet in, the, the bet is in the beginning, okay? So, Bamidbar means literally in the wilderness. Uh, now, this is or, just a new or, example. Or, Okay. But Midbar is just another error. This is just another example of replacement theology. And uh, I have just come to believe over the years, replacement theology is one of the most deceptive tricks and tools of the enemy. Yeah. With it, he has literally deceived 
percent of the church. The elite. He's deceived the elite. He's deceived the elite. I need mean, some of the best Bible teachers. Right? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. We were listening to a guy yesterday on the Glenn Beck show and and coming up the hill and. I just find he was doing Genesis chapter one. So Kathy doesn't know Hebrew. So he's giving all these answers. Like, good, but... yeah, I, I agree <laughs> with a lot of what he was saying. He was an old earth guy, but he was, he wasn't getting the Hebrew right. And that makes a huge difference. <clears throat> so even the elite, even the teachers have been deceived. And, and that's problematic because then we, we go forth as teachers in the body of Messiah and we're teaching falsehoods. Not intentionally, of course, but nevertheless, you're either teaching the word the way it's written or you aren't. And I realize none of us have arrived, so we're all, none of us are teaching the whole truth yet, obviously, because should the Lord tarry by next year, hopefully we will learn some new things. <laughs> and we can teach so Maria, get the mic there. One thing that I found interesting in this study, at the very beginning, the midbar, you said the first letter B was in, the next letter is Mem, and the num the grammatical number for Mem is 40. So when it says wilderness, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. And yeah, that's good. The first letter is for, it's 40. Very good. You see, every letter in the word of God has meaning. And uh, so you don't want to just fly through portions of scripture. And I know it's very tempting, especially when we're going through genealogies and stuff. But if you take all the names that are written in the genealogies, and you bring them into the meaning, uh, you'll have a you'll have an entire story just in the genealogies. So uh, the rabbis teach that even the spaces in the Torah have meaning, and every so often we talk about those because we come to a portion that's in the Torah scroll has spaces set out in a certain pattern or format. For instance, when they cross the Red Sea, there's a huge gap in the writings. And it creates this path through. Okay, so replacement theology, um, we see it in the first five books of the Bible. Uh, better a sheet means in the beginning. And the English translators, this is probably the, the, the closest translation that, that we have in the, in the Torah. It, it, they translated it to Genesis, which loosely means the beginning of things, okay? And that's why it was translated into the Greek as Genesis. But then you get into Exodus. Uh, Exodus is not named Exodus in Hebrew. It's Shemot, the book of Shemot, which means names. Remember the O-T on the end is an S. It's names. Uh, Shemot. So the so we change the book from names to Exodus. Now the problem with this is the Lord tells us very clearly that anybody that changes any part of this word, particularly intentionally, is cursed. Period. So the translators that we've been reading from for 2,000 years, they intentionally mistranslated. Because they were trying to distance themselves from the Jews, anti-Semitism. They, they didn't want to get too close to the Jews because they didn't like the Jews. And they were anti-Semitic. Most of the church fathers uh, were very anti-Semitic. And so when the translations came forth, they distanced themselves. Errol. Could that be why the Council of Nicaea they took almost four years? Could be. I mean, it, it's interesting because at the uh, Nicene Council there was no there was no Jewish rabbis present. They weren't invited, mm -hmm. and uh, 
which is problematic because a large portion of the church at that point in time was still Jewish. And, and of course, the rabbis, they're the ones that spoke the original language of Hebrew. So now you get this room full of people, pastors and, and priests and so on and so forth, trying to translate the word and decide what's right and what's wrong, and they don't even speak the language. Yeah. Okay? That makes sense? So, so we see Exodus was changed. Leviticus was changed. Levit Veikra means he called. Doesn't mean the Levites, and although that's what he called, that's who he called was the Levites. And so well, he kind of just shortened it up and said, okay, well, we'll, we'll call it Leviticus, the book of the Levites. Um, but again, you can see the change here. But Midbar is another example. The, the translators called it Numbers. And they called it Numbers because as we read, there's a lot of, uh, of uh, numbers in here. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> there's a yeah, there's a lot of censuses taken and and counting taken. So they count. They call it numbers, and it's you know it's not the end of the world, but it just shows you how loosey goosey we are with God's word. And if every letter means something in the scripture, when you start changing things even a little bit. When you start changing the first five books, how much do you think that affects by the time you get to the Breed on Shah and then and the book of Revelation? And then Devarim as another example of this. Devarim is uh translated as Deuteronomy, which means second law. Okay, in Greek. And it's called second law because it's a rehash of the rest of the, the previous rest of the Torah. And so, but the name of the book in Hebrew is Devarim, which means words, words. So with that in mind, let's turn over to 1 Timothy 4.1. 1 Timothy 4.1, I'm going to read from New American Standard. And this is, for me, this has been uh, a journey of revelation to come to, the, to terms with what I'm sharing with you. But it says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith. And then it defines how they're going to fall away. It's not just that they're tired and beat up and and... They don't feel like they can go any further. It, it defines why they're falling away. They're paying attention to, to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And I personally come to the conclusion through the years, because you know, if you if you ask a Christian what is the doctrine of demon, they're going to tell you, well, it's like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witness, they don't understand doctrine. But let me ask you a question. Do we really understand doctrine? No, we don't. So does that mean we're also in the same boat? We go from faith to faith. So every group has still some distance to travel. Okay, so yeah, the Mormon doctrine is really off the wall. There's no doubt about that. And I think that probably Doctrine of Demons does enter into that to some degree. But this is kind of a case of the uh, pot calling kettle black. Because here we, uh, most Christian pastors don't know the Hebrew names of the first five books. You know what I'm saying? Very basic stuff. And they don't know it. Because they just go, well, this is what the Bible says. And you hear pastors all the time, what does it say? And then they repeat it. And that's not at all what it says in the original language. Okay? So we really have to take that to heart and understand that replacement theology 
is anytime the Greek believers replaced Jewish belief, not their customs, not their traditions, that customs, traditions don't add up into this equation, but every time that that uh, Greek believers changed portions of scripture, like King James says, I shall not kill, is one of the Ten Commandments. That is not one of the Ten Commandments. It says, I shall not murder. There's a huge difference between murder and killing. And the problem with the, the word killing is that you read that, and then you read just <laughs> not too far further down the road, and God's commanding in Israel to kill everybody. So, uh, so what is it? So it presents these problems for us, and and uh, it's replacement theology. Uh, we talk about this all the time with the Shabbat Sunday worship is replacement theology in action in motion. We've replaced the Shabbat with with Sunday morning. We've replaced the Moedim with Easter, with Christmas, and uh, and, Torah with grace. and Torah with grace. And it was really interesting because uh, Maria brought something up. That's it. Just throw the microphone around. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. In Amos <laughs> chapter 2, uh, was it chapter 2? Five. Chapter 5. I'm, let's turn over there. Amos chapter 5, and I think it was verse 26 or something. Yeah, 26. 25, 26. Turn over here because I want to show you this because this is the nature of people. It's the nature of the enemy. And we see the nature of God in all of this too. And we think we've got it all down as, as Christian believers but we're in process like everyone else, okay? So look what it says. Amos is talking about the children of Israel, and he says, did you present me with sacrifices and grain offerings in the wilderness for 40 years? So what, he's talking about Bamid Bar here, right? He's talking about their time in the wilderness. He says in 26, you also carried along Sikuth. Now, Sikuth is a Sukkot for an idol. And I'm reading this from the New American. You also carried along Sikuth, your king, and Kiyun, your images. That's images of idols, of gods. The star of your gods, which you made for yourselves. He says, therefore, I'm going to make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord. But for 40 years, they carried these idols in the wilderness. Now, remember, Rachel did the same thing. Remember when she left her father's house, Laban's house? She took the family idols. Here we are 2,000 years later, and we have embraced Christmas and Easter and Sunday morning worship. God goes with the people, but he says there's going to be a price to pay. He says, therefore, I'm going to make you go into exile beyond Damascus in due time. The reason for that is we reap what we sow every time. Can we go back to just one more thing, and that is when you went back to these translations and transliterations, you know, so, you know, so what we should just really just study the Hebrew then. What, what, you know, like you have New American Standard, I have New King James, someone else has a New Living, someone else has, a, you know, all these different translations. And I understand about the essence. That is true. But then again, the essence isn't going to be the exact thing like what we're just, what you were just talking about. You know, you're right. We're going to... Okay, I'll get, to her, I'll get to her in a minute. I'll get to her in a minute. No, you're absolutely right. We need to... We need to study the word. 
but the the issue here is most people in the church they don't even read the word never mind study it and and even those that read reading is different than studying a long shot and we're told to really study the word but very few are going to do it and that's why we have that's why in the church we have pastors and teachers and apostles and prophets because these are the people that are typically more dedicated to studying God and trying to find out truth and then relay that truth so for the average person if you capture the essence you're you're ahead of the game now um Refresh my mind. Where where was I going to go with? Well, no, I'm just I'm I'm questioning the translations and transliterations. You know, again, when you study, I mean, yeah. we all have well, we don't all have, but you know, we have a lot of different yeah. Bibles and so forth at home, and we or the tablet yeah. or this or that. So, in what is, um, I guess I'm trying to say. How do we, I mean, you have to really study to get the, the, the point, like what yeah. was brought up in Amos. I mean, here, and then yeah. you actually looked up the names, and I like that, looking up the names. I right. really do. Looking up the names to find out really what were they even saying there in that. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So how do we, how do we get to where we... All, all of our translations come from the Greek, basically. And... In my opinion, that sets us off course immediately. Now, I disagree. Most scholars believe the New Testament was written in Greek. I don't believe that, as you know. And uh, it is true that our oldest complete manuscripts of the New Testament are in Greek. That's true. The oldest manuscripts that we have are written in Greek. And so then they came up with a theory that Hebrew was a dead language. And we were, you know, that was the big thing. Hebrew was a dead language in Yeshua's day. So he spoke some Aramaic and, and, and Greek was really the language of the day. And historically, that's just not true. Um, but we bought into it. Um, the, when we discovered the, the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1948, yeah, we realized that I think it was 70% of the Dead Sea Scrolls are written in Hebrew. And then 20%, I believe, in uh, Greek. I thought it was Aramaic. Maybe it was Aramaic. And then the last 10% was Greek or Aramaic. But 70% was was in Hebrew. And, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they span a, a time frame of about 150 years before Messiah to about uh, 150 after, 200 after, right in that range somewhere. So anyway, we know that at that time, Hebrew was a, a spoken language. We're told that in, on the, the sign above the cross of Yeshua when they crucified him, they had writing in three languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So why would you write on the sign in a dead language? You wouldn't. Peter, who's a fisherman, I doubt seriously that he knew any Greek. He, I'm sure he had picked up on some Latin because the Romans spoke Latin. They didn't speak Greek. And the Romans had conquered Greece 250 years before Messiah. In 250 years, uh, the etymology of a language changes tremendously. So Greek is not a part of the functioning society anymore. Some people probably knew some Greek words here and there. They also mixed in some Aramaic, but they didn't speak Aramaic either because Hebrew is considered the holy tongue for Jews. So why are they going to speak in a 
language that they consider to be pagan. That makes no sense to me. So with that in mind, now, granted, it was translated into Greek. We know that. But ultimately, it's been translated into almost every language in the world. But that doesn't mean it was written in that language. And so the Hebrew becomes very crucial for us. And it's very hard for us with our study materials today to really get uh, the New the New Testament, the Breed Hadashah, in Hebrew. Now, you can get it in Hebrew and study it from that point, but the problem is modern Hebrew is not necessarily the same as ancient Hebrew. There, there are some similarities, but there's also some huge differences. So even if you have... Uh, even if you're a, a Hebrew speaker fluent today, you may not be understanding the New Testament completely. So this, so the end, that's part of replacement theology too. We replace the Hebrew for the Greek, and it's caused huge problems. Now it hasn't caused problems enough that we have to worry because here we read in Amos. The people are carrying idols all the way through their walk. And yet God is still gracious to them. When in fact, idolatry is arguably the worst sin a human being can commit. So we have to understand that, you know, we have our Christmas and we have our Easter and all of that. Uh, and there is a day of reckoning coming. But God still blesses his people even while they're carrying their idols through the wilderness. That's a phenomenal, I'm glad you pointed that out to me today because I, you know, that was very good. I went right upstairs and checked it out, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> I mean, you gotta keep your eye on Maria, you know what I mean? All right, Sharon, you wanna unmute and uh, ask your question? Yeah, I'm, I, it's basically about the Shabbat okay. and all of God's Moedim, the feast days, festivals, um, were to hold, hold a holy convocation. In other words, the whole community is to meet together. Right. It never says that about the Shabbat. Never. It um, only only if it if the Shabbat is on a, a Moedim. Right. And we're not really told, except to do no work, we're not told how to keep the Shabbat. Correct. And um, it, so I kind of understand going to a Sunday worship just because God never says, you know, get all, I want everybody together. Um, and, and we've kind of just grown into that. Right. Um, I, I know during Yeshua's time, the synagogues, the men would meet in the synagogue, um, usually, uh, for Torah study. Um, so I, it's just, uh, you know, we kind of, well, we do, you know, understand that the Sunday worshipers, I don't think are keeping Shabbat. Maybe some of them are, I don't know. Right. But um, so, it, it, you know, we've kind of morphed into taking the Sunday thing and make it, make it a Shabbat thing. Yeah, let me, uh, yeah, it's a good point. Shabbat is, you're absolutely right. We're not commanded to meet. In Leviticus 23. What we do know, however, is the Lord, it was his habit to go to the synagogue on the Shabbat. Mm -hmm. So he set an example for us. We also know that Paul did the same thing. Remember, he, he went down to the river where Lydia and, and the women were meeting. And the reason they were at the river is because if there was not a minion, if there was not 10 Jewish men in a city, 
they didn't build a synagogue. They had to build a synagogue when there was 10 men. So what they would do is if there wasn't 10 men, they would go down to a river near the, because all the cities in those days were built near rivers. They would go down to the river because that way they could do their mikvahs during the course of their Shabbat celebration. And they they kept Shabbat that way. Um, Shabbat is a very difficult thing for us to get a hold of because uh, we don't even talk very much around here, although I study it because we have people that hold to the lunar Shabbat. Mm-hmm. And I'm not really, I'm not a really a real proponent of the lunar Shabbat, but uh, there there is a case to be made for it. And that means that the, in the lunar Shabbat, the, the Shabbat falls on certain day, dates, the 8th, the 15th, the 21st of every month. So every seven days, it's a Shabbat. It doesn't matter what day of the week it is. Now, I don't hold to that particular teaching, but um, I say all that to say this. There's a lot about Shabbat that we don't understand. We're told to keep it and guard it, but we we're never told what that really means. Right. So what we do is we try to follow the example that Yeshua set. He went to the synagogue, and it was a time of fellowship, and it's evolved into what we have today. Um, and of course... What we do know is Saturday was always considered to be the Shabbat, mm-hmm. the seventh day. And and the uh, when the Gentiles came to faith, they changed it to Sunday. So the 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 roots of Sunday worship are for sure tainted. Now again. God blesses Sunday worship. I mean, most of us come out of Sunday church and we got saved under the name of Yeshua, but we're in a progressive walk, learning more and more as we go every year. So as we learn more and more, now once we learn it, we need to apply it. And uh, in the eldership, we go the rounds on these kinds of things because we're trying to get it right. And it's, it's very difficult. What we do know is the word says, do not forsake the fellowship of the saints. Mm-hmm. And what that means is uh, we need to keep a day when we all gather together. Mm-hmm. Because that's definitely an essence or a concept that's taught in the word. And so we, we choose the Shabbat to do that, but we're not really commanded to do that in in the truest sense or in the most literal sense. So then you have to figure out what does that mean? And I think I think what it means, Sharon, is when we come to the place where we we look at all the evidence from the word, we go, you know what? You need to be going into the house of the Lord on the Shabbat. Mm-hmm. That's how I look at it. And and that's the best we've got right now. But that's a very good point you brought up. And like everything else in the Bible, there's more unknown than there is known. That's why I'm uh, that's why I always uh, defer back to the, there's only one non-negotiable, and it's Yeshua and him crucified. Period. That's that really is it, as far as our salvation goes. As far as our walk goes, if you're not in fellowship, whether it's on Shabbat or Sunday, you're not going to grow in the Lord. I've never met anybody that's outside of fellowship that's that's growing. Well, to be balanced. To be balanced. Yeah, to be balanced. We need each other for the balance. Yes. All right. All right, so let's move along. Kathy, you cold or? Okay. No, I'm fine. 
I was just going if it was getting cold in here or not. When they come see me put my jacket on. All right. Okay. When Maria puts on her jacket, we're going to do something with the heat. <laughs> All right. So in letter A, then, the meat bar is a metaphor for the spiritual journey through life. This entire book is a metaphor for our spiritual journey through life. The Mead Bar, the book itself spans 38 to 39 years. And that is obviously the better part of a lifetime, right? Uh, and it takes place in the wilderness, right? Yeah, what's the fill-in for uh, first, the first fill-in? The Mead Bar, in the wilderness. Okay, so um, this is a, a, a picture of a lifetime because life on earth in a fallen condition, which is what we live in, is difficult. The Lord himself said that. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Today's got enough problems of its own. And of course, we're sheep, so we worry about everything. <laughs> doesn't matter what the Lord says we're going to worry about it and I, Kathleen and I are forever and a day we're telling people don't cross bridges that you haven't come to yet because one of the things I've learned in life is you may never come to that particular bridge and have to cross it yeah. and the other thing we say is if you cross a bridge don't burn it because you have to, you might have to recross it, and go back, and unfortunately, you don't learn that till you're you're older, typically, uh, or you have somebody that's older pounding it in. They don't listen. Well, human beings don't listen. It's the nature of the beast, part of the curse. Remember, we're going to have to learn everything the hard way. See, so. This, this uh, metaphor on life is, is very clear. We go, in number one, we go from Egypt to the promised land. That's what the wilderness journey is all about, isn't it? They're, they're leaving Egypt, which is bondage and slavery. God's taken them through this learning curve in the wilderness. And they are eventually going to uh, move into the promised land. And so this is the same picture of what he does with us. He, he takes us out of Egypt. And he found you. You didn't find him. We always have to remember that. He found us. And when he found us, he convinced us through his spirit that we probably should start following him. That wasn't even our idea. Uh, like I always said, I, I wanted fire insurance. I had no intention of really walking with God. I, that was a concept I didn't even know what it meant. Right? I don't think anybody did when we first got saved. You know, walk with God. What, talk with God. How, how do you do that? You know? So he brings us first to Mount Sinai and we meet God. That's where the people, he said, bring the people out three days. You're going to introduce the people to God. Okay. And then the Torah is given to us through life. We start learning God's word. And another part and parcel to replacement theology again is the, the mainline Christian uh, church stops at Yeshua. They come to Yeshua and they stop right there. In the doorway. In the doorway. <laughs> and does anybody see a problem with that? It it's a huge problem because in the in the church as we know it today, everything is Yeshua. He's <laughs> he's the whole enchilada. But he is he's trying to move us into reconciliation with the Father. Amen. And it was the Father that so loved the world that he gave his only son, right? So, Yeshua, Like I always say, Yeshua wouldn't have come and died for any of us if the Father hadn't told him to. 
So that kind of takes an emphasis off Yeshua and places it on the Father, doesn't it? And that's where we need to be. When the disciples asked Yeshua, teach us how to pray, what did he say? He said, pray this way, our Father. And then in John 17, he says, don't pray to me. Pray to the Father in my name. There's a huge difference in those things. But again, replacement theology came in and said, okay, if I can't stop them, I'm going to stop them at the door. And and uh, and that's affected everybody's walk. Sharon. Sharon? Um, yeah. I, I, you know, I was thinking about God walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, in the evening, in the garden. Right. And um, it seems to me that the garden was the first tabernacle. And this was before the fall, of course. And, um, you know, I think God is the one that initiated that friendship in the garden. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, and then of course, the fall. And we were separated completely from God. And... Like Adam was. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Passed out. Um, and then this whole thing, the building of the tabernacle, making it and building it, it was kind of like replacing the garden. Yeah. And that man could now fellowship once again yeah. with our creator. Yeah, that's really good. Actually, I was reading a uh, Jewish comment commentary uh, yesterday and um, very insightful and he, this rabbi was saying the same thing he said the garden was initially the place of fellowship between God and man obviously yes, yes. and uh, when we got kicked out of the garden man in desperation has building has been building sanctuaries that where we can meet with God. Mm -hmm. But the problem is God won't meet in a sanctuary made by man. Right. That's why you're the temple. Now he does show up because wherever two or more are gathered in his name, there he is present. Mm -hmm. But that's a far cry from walking in the cool of the evening. And this is one reason we don't see the same types of miraculous things i think you know the temp the tabernacle was built after very specific instructions and moshe was told by god you make it exactly after the pattern in heaven or i won't be there and so he got everything right down to a gnat's eyebrow and god lived there with the people for 40 years, right? And then we then we moved into Solomon's temple. Um, but even in Solomon's temple, I mean, you've got Samuel, uh, or you've got Eli the prophet, and Ichabod, the glory has departed. It's already departed uh, by the time you get in, and that's at Shiloh. So um, we're on a, we're on the second best track right now, any way you slice it. It doesn't matter what church you're going to. We're in a desperate situation where we're 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 really falling short. So all we can do is the best we can do. And and that's what we're endeavoring to do. That's why I always say in the messianic we're trying to walk with god in a more excellent manner that really to me nails what the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish it makes sense so um obviously you don't like to talk about these things so much because it can breed uh doubt and confusion and everything else mm -hmm. 
we're on course with the Lord, but you have to be willing to admit that we're off course at the same time. And Jeremiah really says it best. He says, you're not walking on the byway, you're walking beside it. You're on the byway, you're not on the pathway now. And you're walking in the in the in the weeds. And the messianic is just a step closer to the path than the Sunday church. They're way out in the weeds. And the Mormons are even further out in the weeds, and the Catholics can't even see the path. You know, but they're trying to walk a parallel path to it. Does that make sense? And so we want to be uh, gracious in that way because if you show mercy, you're going to receive mercy. Right? So that's kind of... I just, when you said that, I kind of had a picture of the destination and all these paths going there, but the one that is straight, the ancient path, and the others are all like this. <laughs> right? Well, that's kind of it. You know? That's kind of it. And I'm not saying in that that all paths lead to heaven. Well, we're saying all biblical. All know, biblical. Yeshua believing. Yeah. Yeah. Paths lead to heaven. Right. So, and um, it's like I said, we're, we're as a Messianic congregation, I, I feel we're closer to the scriptures than the rest of the church. Uh, but we realize we don't even know all the ins and outs of the Shabbat. So, the, so we have a lot to learn still. Of course, that's why we're here studying. Right? All right. So, um, so Israel's goal in this metaphor is the promised land. And of course, that's our goal here in life. And the Bible tells us in the Great Hadashah, it says, first comes the natural, then the spiritual. And what that means in a nutshell is we learn so many spiritual truths from our natural life. I learn more from my life than I do from any other source, really, about spiritual truth. I go, boy, this is kind of a parallel, isn't it? And and you, then you begin to realize. You, you learn reaping and sowing is a true concept, uh, but you don't learn it typically until later in life. So you're <laughs> yeah. <It's terrible. laughs> I know. I, I get envious sometimes because I think, you know, man, what would it have been like to live six, seven hundred years? You know what I mean? And you didn't even start having children until you were a hundred. So I look now and I go, well, as a grandpa, I, I do pretty good. As a father, I think I stunk. And what if I'd been a hundred years old when I was starting with my children? Yeah. It might have been awesome for them and for me. But that's all part of the of the curse again. Just think how much we you just think how much knowledge and wisdom you would have after six or seven hundred years of living. Man. Oh, don't you wish you could go back, no matter where you're at right now, don't you wish you could go back to 18 with the wisdom and the knowledge that you have right now? Your your whole life would be different. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't mind going all the way back to the womb with the, the knowledge and wisdom that I have now and then start growing from that point. Man, everything would be different. Now we're running to catch up. We're trying to catch up. And, you know what I mean? Catch up is always hard. It is. Catch up is very difficult, and that's where we're at. And and the <laughs> enemy has set all of that into motion, see? And he's continued on with it, with doctrines of demons, so on and so forth. Okay. In, uh, num in letter B, the Lord... 
Mabid, uh, Mada. <laughs> Metabare. Thank you. Metabare speaks. Metabare is the Hebrew word for speaks. If I were to say Atah uh, Metabare uh, Ivri, in Hebrew, I'd be saying to you, do you speak English? Okay. Uh, Metabare speaks to us in the mead bar, which is the desert. Okay? So the Lord, Medebar, speaks to us in the mead bar, the desert. Now, I want to show you something here that I put up on the, on the board. Just, just show you the root here. This is the word debar. Okay. It's it's uh Dalit Bet uh Resh Debar. And it means it's the root word, it's the three most Hebrew words all stem from a three-letter root word. And so this is the three-letter root for speak. Okay. In Hebrew. Um, it's spelled, well, now, that's speak, debar. This is bear. What we, we have the same root, three letters root here, the uh, the uh, Dalit, the uh, uh, Bet, and the Resh, and we, we, we put a mem in front of it. So, bear. Okay? Now, you see, it's it's the same, it's M-D-B-R, M-D-B-R in English. And that's the same as, because there's no vowels, it's the same word as midbar. M-D-B-R. Does everybody see that? And this is wilderness. Midbar, but midbar, which we're in now, means in in the wilderness. So this is wilderness. So you see how in the Hebrew we have speaking, God speaks to us in the wilderness. Okay? But is wilderness the same as desert? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's technically uh, in Hebrew it's the same thing. Yeah. I'm not even sure well, we in English we lean more towards desert. We don't say I'm going out to the wilderness today. Right, right, right. You know. Well, I look at wilderness sometimes it's in the forest or in you know in the trees. Uh, yeah. The desert. Yeah, we consider the mountains more wilderness than the desert. Right. Wilderness just means a vast uh open space of of no population, no society. So, if the Hebrew word for speak is be there, what do you think the M in front of it, the mem means? Oh, it doesn't mean. Well, it's the numerical 40. You can't, can't. Oh, can't un unmute yourself. Do you have an answer for the question? Uh, yes. Uh, davar means thing, and De bear, so it's pronounced. You pronounce the b, the bet. Uh, le da bear is to speak, and then whatever word you want to use. Right. But so davar is thing. So what would the m mean? M, a mem. Yeah. yeah, to speak. Le da bear is to speak. Yeah. What's me de bear? Me de bear. Who's yeah. speaking? But I don't think that's proper speak uh, grammar. But. Okay. See, and now this Kent is a Hebrew speaker, so this shows the difference between the old and the new Hebrew. And it it, it it's a little rough for us right. because we Davaris, don't... Davaris is also a name of a major newspaper in Israel. 
Davar. Right. Thing, spelled exactly as you spell it. No, yeah. no, it's spelled, uh, I think it's spelled differently. There's a Vav there. Okay, yeah, uh, there's no Vav in that. Right, okay. Devarim means words. Devarim. So it's really to speak. Now you could uh, you could throw words in there. Uh, I I I I gave him a word. I spoke to him. That's loosely, but but it, it really is to speak. Even in modern in modern Hebrew, that, that's what I just shared with you. How you would say, um, "Do you speak English?" A top meter bar Hebrew. Do you speak English? Meter bar. As can't is wilderness the same as desert? Can't. Yes. Is yes. wilderness the same as desert in Hebrew? Midbar is desert. Wilderness. It is the same word for both, right? I believe so, but yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So you can see the, the issues here with because modern Hebrew didn't come back until it started in the 1800s when the Zionists started coming back into Israel after 2,000 years of vacancy, they came in and decided they wanted to reinitiate the Hebrew language. And so, uh, I mean, even in Hebrew, there are some words that, that they don't even have Hebrew for. I mean, telephone is telephone in Hebrew. Because there's, bus is autobus, autobus which is uh, kind of the same as the uh, uh, European. So they had to take some of these things that in the 1800s, they didn't even have, you know, telephones. I mean, so they didn't have a word for it. So what they did is they borrowed from the English. Ken. Yeah. Uh, well, they invented a word for television ages ago called silver screen, a masacha kesef. But then they created color TV, so they went back to televisia because they couldn't keep changing the word. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, the, etym the etymology of language is... It's very hard to just come right out and say, this is it. It changes, and it changes over time. Look at the English language has changed in our own lifetime. Yeah. So never mind 200, 300 years, and never mind a couple thousand years. You know, it, it's barely the same language. So this becomes the issue. That, By the way, that's also the problem with Greek. And that's why you'll have Greek interpreters always make note of the fact that they're they're quoting from the Koine Greek. But even that is pretty marginalized, in my opinion. So, you know, it's an interesting study, but you gotta be ready to come up with a big fat zero at the end because <laughs> This is why I love the scripture that says David uh, fulfilled the purposes of God in his generation. We have to deal with our generation. Right, wrong, good, bad, or ugly, it doesn't matter. This is where we're at. This is where God has us. And we need to do the best we can with the information we have. Should God tarry another thousand years? Uh, the Messianic is going to be teaching things that we've never even heard of. I can't imagine what that is. But when you show yeah. Yeah. So all right. So now in number one, the the word, the Torah, 
was written to teach us and to warn us. To teach us and to warn us. Turn to Romans 15, 4. From the New American Standard, you all right? Good? Good. Oh, yeah. Okay. Just choking a little bit. Yeah, just choking, okay. I was just wondering if I needed to run over there and do the Heimlich. <laughs> <laughs> Romans 15, 4. And what we're talking about, the word is written to teach us and to warn us. It's a dual, dual purpose, okay? Look what it says. For whatever was written in earlier times, that's for sure the Torah, was written for our instruction. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Okay? Notice the purpose is not to get everything 100% right. God's smarter than that. He knows that's never going to happen in one human lifetime. I, I'm not even sure that's going to happen in all of eternity for us, personally. I think we're going to be growing. I think we may be learning forever. And that I'm up for that because I love to learn. But for a lot of people, that probably doesn't sound that appealing. I don't know. But uh, I'm not sure. I, I honestly don't think you're going to have it all together when you arrive in heaven. No. Yeah. Don't know. yeah. And again, that learning to me it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. You have you can have a lot right. of knowledge, but it's the relationship when you have that with him. Can you imagine? I mean I I, I think about all the time walking in the pool but evening i think about that all the time you know to speak to to you know like enoch you know to sing to have conversation that just amazes me but i think that is where we, we're headed into that deeper it's that one-on-one yeah. -on -one talk that you can only say to you you know you know what i mean it's that right. conversation that that is so intimate that it just br brings his love to us that I don't know that we would worship him even more. I don't know. It's it's to me it's all re relationship. You know. Oh, it is. Yeah. I mean, even uh, in the Hebrew, when it says he walked in the cool of the evening, the word there for cool is is the word ruach. Oh. Yeah, it's not cool at all like we think of cool. It's walking in the spirit. In the spirit. Oh, that's in good. the garden. That's great. And and so that's the Hebrew, say it, it and it changes it. The yeah. cool of the evening, you say, it sounds like a nice romantic little walk, uh -huh. which I'm sure that but qualifies, it but it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but you're but you're walking you can only walk with God in the spirit. Just because it's cool outside doesn't mean you can walk with God. You have to be in the spirit. And, no, we're learning. We're learning with that as Frank. Well, you just said that you're not even sure that we're going to be done when we get to heaven. The flesh, the, the flesh dies. We don't take the flesh to heaven, do we? No, we don't. But the mind is being renewed. So does it stop being renewed the day you die? Oh. Uh, I don't know. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I should have been the White House press secretary. <laughs> What's the answer? Uh, there is no hardcore answer. I, you know, some people honestly think that when we get to heaven, every, it's you're, it's done. You're you're you completely your journey, and it's you've got the mind of Messiah, and and everything's perfect. I. I'm, I take a little different stand. I think everything in heaven is perfect, but I think we're still learning. The It said, it tells us the angels are still learning about God's mercy and grace. Mm -hmm. 
through his dealings with us. So how long have they been in the presence of the Father? We don't even know that. But it could be, I'm an old earth creationist, so it could easily be billions of years. And angels may have been created even before the creation story. We're not told when they were created. We know they were created, but we don't know when or where. Well, do we know where the bad angels were created? The bad angels were initially good angels. Right. And they fell. So, no, we don't know when they were created. Lucifer was the most perfect of God's creation. He was the most perfect thing. So you, you probably could make an argument that he was the first thing created. I'm not saying that I believe that, but you probably could make an argument for that because he was the perfect specimen, so to speak. Uh, but uh, when, were, when were they created? I don't know. Nobody knows. We're not, we're not told. But we do know that they're still learning. And at the very least, they've been at the very earliest, they've they've been with the father for uh six thousand years, there, give or take. If they were created at the same time that that the young earth says, that would be the oldest they would be. But that means they've been learning for 6,000 years. So I, I think that, uh, I think we're going to be, I don't think you're ever going to tap God out. I don't see how that's possible. If, if you, I don't know, let's move on big for me. It's above my pay grade. <laughs> I don't know. Are you going to do verse two? Take the censor? I am going to be talking about the census, yes. Okay. Because I have something to say about that. Okay, I figured you would. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so it's written to teach and warn us. Turn now over to First Corinthians 10, 6, and 11. It says, now these things happened as examples for us so that we could, so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. And then verse 11, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So if we really think we're living in the end times, all that we're reading in Bamid Bar, for instance, is for our instruction. What can we learn out of it? And that's that has to be our quest. You know, your quest in studying the Bible isn't to uh, necessarily memorize all the scripture. It's not to know what all the Greek and the Hebrew says. It's not to know all those intricacies. The devil knows all of those things. Our goal is to study the Bible and apply it to our lives so that we change and so that we're conformed into the image of Messiah. Okay? Now, here's a biblical, in small letter A, a biblical theme that we see throughout the scriptures. We see it over and over and over and over again, which means we probably should make a note of it because if it happened to them, we just read, this is for our instruction, we're going to be faced with the same dilemmas, period. I don't care who you are, you're going to be faced with this. And here's the theme. The Israelites become dissatisfied. You could put any number of words in there. You could disgruntled, uh, um, angry, disillusioned, unfaithful. It could be any of those words. I, I just use dissatisfied. The Israelites become dissatisfied 
and they rebel. Don't we do the same thing when we get upset with God? He doesn't do something the way we think he should do it. We get all ticked off and we're going to show him. And, uh, you know, we're like a bunch of little school kids running off. It's freaky, really. Okay. So they rebel. God is angry and brings discipline. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Moshe, those aren't the blanks. Moshe intercedes and the people repent. And the cycle starts all over again. Isn't that really the cycle that we go through? Unfortunately, it really is. Now, the thing I want you to notice about this scenario, and the thing that I thought was so interesting out of Amos that we looked at earlier, I want you to notice God never sent them back to Egypt. And he threatened to kill them all. But they were going to heaven. He never sent them back into Egypt to their old life. And for me, this tells me that God is going to complete in us the work that he's begun. We just read in Amos, these people had idols all through the wilderness where the, the presence of God is there, the pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day, the, the manna is falling every morning, the birds are flying through. God has drowned the Egyptian army. Their, their shoes aren't wearing out. They're, it's a, we haven't seen God move that powerfully in our generation. We've seen him do some awesome things. Things, but like you have a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day over your house, and and you can hear the the voice of God booming down off the mountain. If you do, we'll be right over. <laughs> yeah, we 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 haven't. They experienced the presence of God in spite of the fact that they had hidden idols. But look, let me get Harold first. He was first. Well, the original word for Egypt is Mitzrayim, which yeah. is constraints. Yeah. Yeah. Mitzrayim. The whole sermon right there. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. He sets us free from that. And he never sends the people back. He's always pushing them forward. But he didn't let them go in. He no. And so where does that fall into place? Because... He didn't let them go into the promised land because of all that they did. So I, I've always struggled with that particular portion. Okay, good question. The church typically refers to the journey through the wilderness of life, and then you go into the promised land, that's heaven. Because the church makes everything about heaven. But that's not, it's not a symbol of heaven, really. If it is, then Moshe's not there. Mm. Aaron's not there. You see, Miriam's not there. You see what I'm saying? That's not a picture of going into heaven. What it is, is a picture of going into the promised land. And now, today, you are the land. If you will. You're the temple. You're the land. You're the tabernacle. And you need to enter into the pro what does promised land mean? It just means a promise, a promise in the land. So God has made us promises. So this is the kingdom of heaven. When the Bible talks about the kingdom of heaven, like I'm always saying, it's not really speaking of heaven per se. It's speaking of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And that's how the Lord taught us to pray that it would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then Paul comes along in Romans, defines what the kingdom is. He says the kingdom is not eating meat or drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. He doesn't mention heaven at all. 
And this is why when the Lord came, when John the Baptist came, he said, the kingdom is coming. When Yeshua got here, he said, the kingdom is here. I brought it. it that's, another, that's another problem that stems, in my opinion, out of replacement theology. It's all about going to heaven. It's not all about going to heaven, or the Lord would have taken you the day you got saved. It's all about your walk with God. Mm -hmm. Your relationship, as you were saying earlier, about your relationship with God. He wants you to walk with him here in the midst of everything. Does that, does that make sense? So that's how I view it. And again, I'm in the minority there because most of the church sees this whole story as going to heaven. But we run into some huge problems. Like I said, if, if, that's, if, if the people didn't enter the promised land, that just means they didn't enter into the promises of God that God had for them. God left giants in the land. Yeah. Yeah. There were giants every. Yeah, it wasn't heaven. They had to fight. And so it was symbolic. I, I mean, you can stretch it out to, to mean heaven in a very vague way. But the emphasis for most believers becomes that's what it's talking about. But then, like I said, we have some big problems on our hands. Let me get Janie, and then I'll get you, Sharon. Knowing our own sinful nature, which I think any of us that are honest with ourselves, we see that on a daily basis. When we're making choices in life, the things yeah. that we say, the things that we do, uh, knowing all of that, if it was indeed just about all about heaven, wouldn't that drop kick us, as it were, over the goalpost of doing more works and better works and bigger works and being in competition to just um, to show how much improved we are. Yeah. Well, in my opinion, most believers are on a works trip. Uh, I talk to believers and most believers, well, they know the doctrine. They, they know the scripture and they say, no, you're not saved by works. And yet, as soon as somebody falls into some sin, they go, he lost his salvation. So they equate works with salvation. And that really is not what it, what it is. If you equate works, if you equate, oh, you're guilty of adultery or murder, and you're not going to go to heaven because of that, then David's not in heaven. He was guilty of both those things. Moses was a murderer. Paul held the coats. We think that was Paul held the coats when Timothy was stoned. Or not Stephen. Timothy, uh, Stephen. When Stephen was stoned. So he participated in that. And he was on his way to Damascus to arrest believers to have them imprisoned or executed. These people were vicious. You know, I mean, David, think of David, a man after God's own heart. The two messengers show up with the news of Saul's death, and they're they're happy because now David can rise to the, the to the throne. David pulls out a sword and runs them both through. Well, you didn't mess. David was not a man to mess with. Neither was Moses. You know, Moses beat up all those guys at, at the well there. Remember that? <clears throat> Jethro's daughter, when he met Jethro's daughter. These, these guys were, they were tough. They were seasoned fighters. They were seasoned fighters, and they were very, uh, <laughs> they were very down-to-earth, carnal people like us. Yeah, I mean, yeah, David had 32 giant killers amongst his mighty men. But David was the only one who killed a giant. He had 32 of them that we know about. But, you know, these guys, they were no joke. 
far as in the natural. So that that becomes the that issue about and the reason for that is because human beings naturally default to performance. If I do well, I'm rewarded. If I mess up, I'm disciplined. And then there is a certain amount of truth to that. We do reap what we sow, but it has nothing to do with your salvation. If it did, not one of us would be going to heaven. Not one. You go, well, I never murdered anybody. Well, the Lord said, if you've ever uh, called somebody a fool, mm -hmm. you murdered them. That's how he sees it. doesn't matter how you see it. Your opinion doesn't count with God. Did he ever ask you for your opinion on anything? Ever? He hasn't me. Yeah. And, and it's really a good idea not to try to force your opinion on him. That doesn't go over well. He, he, he And his word says he, he doesn't take counsel from anybody. There's, there's nobody for him to take counsel from. Um, Sharon, did you have your hand up? Yes. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, you know, God leaves much of himself mysterious. Yeah, yeah most. Yeah. And last week we were talking about being casual with God, and he yeah. didn't like that at all. Yeah. Um, and I think he wants us to search out those things that are mysterious, those things that are hidden from our sight. And when we do and really search out, he knows how passionate we are about him. Right. And the passion is what he wants. He wants the hot, not yeah. the cold. Right. Um, he or, or the lukewarm right and i mean that is such intimacy to be searching out what god has hidden but he actually wants us to search those things out and um and find them out about him it's kind of like your lover or your wife or spouse in the very beginning right. we're ardent and very passionate yeah. uh, and it, to me you know just from last week's um teaching and how he does not like um casualness or lukewarmness or whatever you want to call it right he wants us to be passionate about him yeah, and that's a hard posture to keep 24-7. Well, it is. It is. And so, you know, if you alleviate some time each day or each week to to study things out, I think it's a good thing. Yeah. Um, well, study to show yourself approved. Yes, yes. And... That would that would be an interesting study in and of itself because what does approved mean really? Mm -hmm. You know, you don't you don't get saved because you study. No, well, that would be worse. So, what does it mean? Study to show yourself approved. What are you trying to get approved for? What 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 does that qualify you for? <clears throat> Good point. Thanks. All right, let's move down then to letter C. I want to talk about the duality of our walk with God. Sharon's uh, comment and question kind of took us right into this, this uh, matter, the duality. How many know you have a duality of nature? Is that correct? You know, you got, you got the good Tila. <laughs> and you got the bad deal. <laughs> right? It, you know, and we're all stuck with that, aren't we? That's just 
how it is. Uh, and that's what Paul was struggling with. I do the things I don't want to do. I don't do the things I want to do. Who in the world is going to deliver me from this body of death? Now, he's a believer when he says this. Who's going to do it? Well, he knows the answer. He's, it's a rhetorical question. But um, really, when am I going to be delivered from this? Well, this is a lifetime process. Because about the time you get delivered and set free from one issue, doesn't another one pop right up in its place? Yeah. And then you, oh my gosh, where did that come from? And the Lord says, well, that was always in there. We're just going to start working on it today. I didn't want you to get bogged down with it, so I didn't show it to you. You were hiding your idols as you walked through the wilderness with me. But now I'm bringing them out. Because we're going to deal with them. See, he doesn't condemn you when he knows full well what's in there. That was such a good... Uh, I was so glad you brought that to me, Maria, from Amos. It was just really lended itself to so much of what we're looking at today. And our tendency is we want we we want to beat ourselves up. You know, we beat others up when they don't attain to the 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 standard that we think they should attain to, and then we beat ourselves up when we don't attain. We're a very negative part of creation when you think about it. You, you've got to fight to be positive. And, and we're telling people all the time, you've got to be positive. And I'm not talking about name it and claim it, faith. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, you need to be real, but you need to be positive in it. You can choose to be positive no matter what's going on. Now, I realize some things are much harder to, to bring that positivity out when you're dealing with it. I know that. We all know that. But shouldn't we be working on that? Isn't the Lord really? He's very positive with us all the time. He loves us. He cherishes us. He's got a plan for our life. He's encouraging us constantly. When in fact, we're kind of trying to run our own program. I mean, when we run our own program, we wonder why we don't get healed or set free. It's like the in, it's like the inmates in a in an insane asylum running the insane asylum. No one's going to get better. <laughs> <laughs> I won't live either. You know, what I mean, it's it's insanity. <laughs> What can you say, right? So, this duality of our walk, we have a duality of nature, but because of that duality of nature, we also have a duality uh, of our walk with the Lord. Because depending on which part of your nature is in control at that moment, is really going to determine your walk, isn't it? For that moment. I mean, none of us can just say, I'm walking with God. Well, your general direction is, yes, I think you are walking with God, but you've been known to take a detour or two. And, and it's for no, a lot of times it's for no real reason. You just wake out. You just get crazy. And then you, and then you start whining and crying because you're out in the weeds. And you're lost, and you're not sure how to get back. And then God brings you back. You walk a few steps, and <laughs> out you go again. <laughs> am I right or am I right? I mean, it's it's just now for me. I've come to a place. Obviously, this doesn't justify your little winging adventures. Okay. But what it does do is it shows me and teaches me about the patience, the mercy, and the grace of our God. How many times does he forgive? As many times as I ask him. First John 1 John 1.9. He says, you're getting it. You're getting there. You're pretty slow, but you're not stupid. 
<laughs> You're getting there. And that encourages me. For me, that's encouragement. It, it may be or may not be for you, but for me, I get encouraged because of his mercy towards me. My mistakes, you know, if I do well, I kind of expect a pat on the back from him. Okay, Lord, I, I did good. You can pat me on the back now. Anytime you'll be fine. <laughs> And, and that's not too smart. <laughs> but when I when I jettison out of control, I don't expect the pat on the back, right? It's a kick. <laughs> and and I appreciate it tremendously when he draws me back. We're drawn back to him through his loving kindness. We're drawn to repentance through his loving kindness. That, what a powerful concept that is. And I'm nowhere near there yet. I haven't learned that one for myself or extending that to other people. You know, I have very clear limits. And I'm not saying they're godly limits, but they are limits. And when I hit them, boy, I've hit them. That's not good. So we want to work on this duality of our walk, and we want to get that duality out. Now, with that duality of, of our walk with God, I put something up here on the board again. And, um, well, you know what? Let me read the scripture here first, and then I'll talk about what's on the board. Let's go to Numbers 1-5. From the complete Jewish Bible, five to seven. Now remember, Moshe was told to gather the men, leaders from each tribe. So these are the men to take with you from Reuben, uh, Elidzur, uh, the son of Shadur, from Shimon, uh, uh, Slumiel, the son of uh, Zuri Shaddai, and from Judah, Nachshon, the son of Abinadab. Okay. So I want to talk about Nakshon now. <clears throat> Nakshon is an interesting person in the scripture, but I want to show you something about the duality of our walk and the duality of our personality just in the way the Hebrew is written. This is the name Nakshon. Nakshon. It's Nun Ket Shin. Nakshon, okay, or Nakash, rather, excuse me, Nakash. Now, Nakash is the Hebrew word for serpent. This is the devil's name, Nakash. He, and when you read about the serpent in Genesis, you're going to read Nakash. Nakash. Get that. Nakash. Okay, Nakash. Now, Nakshon. The same three root letters right here, the noon, the het, the sheen, right? Same three letters. But now we add on a yud right here and, uh, and a noon sophie. This is the same letter as this, but at the end of the word, the noon, instead of curving back, goes straight down and extends below the line. So... Noon, het, sheen, yud, noon, sophie. Okay? Nakshon. Nakshon is the prince of the tribe of Judah. His name means foretells. So you see that you can see here the duality of the character. And the, and the duality of the walk with God, okay? So you have this serpent in the middle of it all, and you have the ability to foretell prophetically God's plans, okay? Now, with that in mind, and by the way, you, 
you have all of this in your name too. I've really thought a lot about names since coming into the Messianic because I often wonder if the name shapes the character of a person or does the character of the person proclaim or, or prophesy the name? I don't, I don't cliche as children. Yeah. They give a negative name. Yeah. Yeah. Many were given yeah. negative names. I mean, it, it's uh, Benjamin, son of my right hand, but but uh, Jacob calls him in the blessing a ravenous wolf. I mean, so we have this duality going on. All of us do. The Lord knows that. So um, so how does he deal with this? So let me let me share with you some some thoughts here about Nakho. Now Nakho is the fifth in the descent from Judah. Now Rabbi Yuda says this, and this is so interesting. Um, the rabbis teach us that Nakshon, when Moses lifted the staff at the Red Sea, it didn't part right away. He lifts the staff, and Nakshon runs out into the water and when he gets into the water, the water, and at the same time, Moses lifts his staff. So not shown, enters the water, Moses raises the staff, and the water parts. Now this becomes a, a type and picture of Yeshua later on walking on the water. Okay? Now, let me read what, what uh, Rabbi Yudas says about this. None of the tribes were willing to go first into the sea. Then Nakshon, the son of Abinadab, leapt forth and descended into the sea. Regarding his struggle in the sea, the scriptures in Psalm 69, 1 to, 1 to 2, and then 15 say, Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. I have sunk in the deep mire and there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and a flood overflows me. May the flood of the water not overflow me, nor the deep shall, nor the deep swallow me up, nor the pit shut its mouth on me. So they're relating this psalm to Nakshon, saying this was a, about Nakshon, who is the prince of the tribe of Judah. So this is a picture of Yeshua. He is a type and shadow. He's as much a type and shadow of Yeshua as Moshe is. We have types and shadows all the way through the Bible. He, says, he goes on, meanwhile, Moses is busy making protracted petitions of prayer. Remember in Exodus chapter uh, 14 or 15? I think it's in uh, 14, actually. He's The Lord re kind of rebukes him and says, stop praying and get these people moving forward. Knock off the prayer. Do you see the enemy's coming right up on your tail here? Get these guys moving. So this is what he says here. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Moses is busy making protracted petitions of prayer. The Holy One, blessed be, he scolded him. My beloved ones are about to drown in the sea, and you're making long prayers before me. Moses asked him, Lord of the universe, what can I possibly do? He answered in Exodus 14, 15, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the sons of Israel to go forward. See, you, this type and shadow of Yeshua has gone into the water already. And we're to follow him. You'll, 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 you'll be in the flood, but you won't drown when you're following God. Okay. As for you, lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the sons of Israel shall go forth through on the midst of the sea on dry land. 
So he goes on, he says, because of Nakshon's faith and bravery, the tribe of Judah was worthy to be given dominion over Israel, as it is said in Psalm 114.2, Judah became his sanctuary, Israel, his dominion. Very interesting. Now, we, we know there's other reasons why Judah emerged to the, to the top, uh, and that was because Reuben, the firstborn, slept with his father's, uh, you know, wife. And then you have uh, Simon and, and Levi did their little thing with the, uh, the, uh, the, the circumcision with the, was it uh, the, the Shechemites, wasn't it? Or, uh, yeah, I forget who now, but uh, so... You, the first three sons were disqualified, so now Judah emerges to the top. Why did Judah become his sanctuary and Israel his dominion? Because, as it says in the next verse, the seed looked at Nakshon and fled, and that's from the the uh, uh, from Sota thirty seven a. Okay, so. And it's interesting, Israel means what? It has a twofold meaning. Israel means one who strives with God, but it also means a prince with God. See that duality of nature, that duality of our walk. So we can be Nechash one minute and not show them the next. Make sense? All right. Then let's go back to Numbers 1, verse 2 to 4. From the New American Standard. Take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel by their families by their father's households, according to the number of names, every male, head to head, from 20 years old and upward, whoever is able to go out to war in Israel, you and Aaron shall number them by their armies. With you, moreover, there shall be a man of each tribe, each one head of his father's household. Okay. Now, in Roman numeral three in your notes, the census teaches us about God's family. For one thing. Now, this becomes very confusing because God commands us not to count his people. In fact, we've gotten into to, uh, in depth discussions in our leadership over counting. And as you know, we don't count the number of people in a meeting. Uh, but there have been individuals that have taken it to an extreme, the letter of the law. And when we count how many people we have coming to Sukkot, for instance, they get all uptight because they say we're counting. I go, no, you're missing the whole point. You're missing the essence. We, if we're going to have a, an old name, we have to count. We can only seat so Passover. You can only seat so many people. That's that. So we have to have a count. When we're told not to count, it's because God doesn't want us to count numbers and let numbers be our security blanket. Because if we count numbers, I mean, the number one question at any pastor's conference in the world, how many people are you running? We just got asked that a few weeks ago. We went and saw someone. Yeah. How many numbers do you have? We go, well, we don't count. I don't know. Not a mega church. We're not worried. Well, you shouldn't be worried anyway. It, it's, it's forbidden for you to count the sheep. Period. Now, when we count for, like I said, for a Passover meal or an Oneg or something, well, that's, that's a whole different matter in my opinion. Okay? Now, 
It's interesting because in Israel's history, there were nine counties, nine censuses taken total in the history of Israel. And there's going to be one more census taken in the Messianic age. There's going to be a total of 10 all told. I turn to Jeremiah 33, 13. I'm going to show you the one from the Messianic age. Thirty-three, thirteen. Jeremiah thirty-three, thirteen says, "In the cities of the hill country, and and we're talking about the the millennial reign here. In the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the lowland, in the cities of the Negev, in the land of Benjamin, and then in the environs of Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, the flocks will." Again, pass under the hands of the one who numbers them, says the Lord. So there's going to be another census in the millennial reign. So a total of 10. Now, as I said, God numbers his people. You and I are not allowed to because we measure success by numbers or failure, or failure by numbers. And that is not, listen. Yeshua, by human standards, was a complete failure in his ministry. There was, there was many itinerant preachers, running, rabbis running around with followings that were almost as large as his, if not some larger. And he ends up at the cross with his mother and one disciple. He even had so many people leaving him at one point. He turns to his 12 and he says, are you guys going to leave too? That's, and he ends his ministry after only three and a half years hanging on a cross as a criminal. By human standards, that measures up to be a total failure. Does it not? And yet... It's the most successful ministry in the history of mankind. So we have to be really careful because when you're you're comparing numbers, oh, we're running, we always joke around, we say, well, we're running somewhere between three and well, 500. That's what they say. <laughs> yeah, I have somewhere between three and 500. That means three people to 500 people. <laughs> that sounds better. <laughs> but we measure success that way if I have a mega church obviously I'm successful many of the mega churches look at T.D. Jakes look at that somebody told me the other day he's down to about 20 people now when you hear a sermon there's almost no Bible uh, Joel Osteen there is no Bible. There is no Bible. The, the, there, and yet they fill stadiums every Sunday morning. But is that successful in God's eyes? No, not really. <clears throat> that's that's not the measurement for success. Let me put it that way. So. Uh, so what is the measurement for success? Well, it's, it's what are you imparting to the people? What are the people gleaning? And are people growing? That's success to, to God. So are you doing that? Are we doing that in our ministry? And the Messianic is very discouraging because people come in and then they, they hang around for a week or two and then they're gone. It, it's hard to get new people into the Messianic movement. And that's, for a pastor, that's extremely discouraging. Beyond words. You know, even small numbers can be very discouraging. I've learned to get over that pretty, pretty much. I always say, I always took out our church is whoever shows up. That's who God has there, period. That's it. Just a quick let, let me get Frank first. Yeah, first. yeah uh, 
I wouldn't normally ask this, but now that you dropped a couple of names, I watched that uh, Eric Prince, that South Korean preacher. Uh, how would you compare, compare him to those mega churches? I've never really listened to him. I don't listen to, to preachers. He puts the bad people. <laughs> <laughs> I used to watch him because I thought he was okay, but uh, he, he goes in with uh, Oral Roberts. He's a word of faith teacher, which I'm not opposed to word of faith uh I mean, I hold to a lot of the word of faith myself, but I think it's been taken to an extreme that's not healthy in many cases. But to be perfectly honest, I don't listen to other preachers. I never have. I I try to get whatever I get from the Lord. And, uh, well, I'll pray for you. <laughs> Yeah. Quick, quick story. Just when, when I first started teaching years and years ago, and you know, I, I it was our first Bible study, and we were going to teach it, and and study night and day, you know, to prepare this thing, and I'm listening to the Holy Spirit, and and, and we get to the house, and I'm thinking there's going to be a lot of people there. One person showed up, <laughs> and I was so I was so I I, I you know Carol didn't know what to do with me because I was so angry and I was frustrated and discouraged. And she said, we better get quiet with the Lord. And I got quiet. And the father said, and the father said to me, he said, it doesn't matter. It's just one person. I've called the people to come to listen to what I'm saying, not what you're saying. Yeah. And so and after that, never bothered me whether there were 50 people that came to Bible study or two or three. It didn't make any difference. And that's really what it's all about. It's his word yeah. to whoever he wants to speak it to. I'm pretty well over it, but it, it, I didn't get it in one try. I'm slower than you. I, uh, I I wrestled with it for years. And then the problem was I would get frustrated and angry, and then that would come out in the message. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so now you're just shooting yourself in the foot, you know, because you're, you're starting to yell at the people that are there. <laughs> it's crazy making. Sure. Honestly, it, it's, you know, and but even as the pastor, I mean, I have to work through my issues too, just like everybody else. And and uh, you, as a pastor, you want a, a healthy, good-sized congregation for many reasons. But, and that was one of the issues even going into the Messianic. We had to really weigh that out because we knew what we were getting into. Sure glad you made the right choice. And uh, <laughs> by that time, I... I had really, I had resolved. I knew that I was going to follow the Lord. Period. As it's just Kathleen and I, then that's what it is. But you know, and and God has kept us going. I mean, we're we're one of the smallest congregations on the mountain now. I don't know if we're the smallest, but we're one of them for sure. You sure we're at twelve. Yeah, I know. It's, I always tell myself that. And he only had one at the cross. The rest were in hiding when he needed them most. You know, so we all have our demons, if you will, that we have to work work through. And and if you're smart, you'll just knuckle under and just start dealing with them. Because you your your quest to be like the Lord has to be greater than your quest to be white. You know, the Lord said that the world hates me, they're going to hate you. Mm -hmm. So if you're trying to gain the love and the affection of the people, you you can't do both at the same time. You get Maria first. Well, you can do both. Okay. Well, I'm just going to quote from, from somebody wrote in here that a tent preacher had only one person show up at his tent to preach, and he canceled the service. It was John Wilkes Booth who showed up. Yeah, <laughs> wow. yeah, that I've read that before. <laughs> I've preached. I've preached to one person before, <laughs> Kathleen. She was the only one that showed up. I showed up. Oh. <laughs> and the, and the Lord said, "You preach as if the the room's full." Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 
God, he, he has to humble all of us, doesn't he? You have to. You have to, if you want to be like Yeshua, yeah. that's what it is. And there's no shortcuts. That means you're going to, you're going to learn the things you have to learn. And you always want to pray, Lord, I want to learn quickly and easily. As easy as possible. Well, I want to share what I learned from this, from verse two, the censors. Okay. The censors. Okay, the census. Um, <laughs> censors are a different thing. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's not getting technical here. That, you taught on this, I don't know how long ago, but you said it wasn't that it literally it means to lift up the head. It doesn't yeah, mean it lift up the yeah. head. And when I was reading that, I remember a quotation that, that Yeshua said that what Moses wrote, he was writing about me. And I, when I saw that, I went back to that verse. And if you read the whole thing, it says, lift up the head of the congregation yeah. of the sons of Israel by their family, by right. their father's household, according to the number of names, every male, skull by skull. It's not head by head. Right. It's skull by skull. So I thought, what is that word? Because if you look at it in Hebrew, it, it looks like um, it's la, la gol golathin. It's, it's, and it it's, sounds it's like the same word. Like, it's, go, it's Golgotha. It's Golgotha. So I, I yeah. went back to yeah. Golgotha. And if you read that verse, uh, chapter 23 of Luke, verse 3, when Yeshua lifted up their heads, at the place called Golgotha, yeah. there they crucified him. Right. And Yeshua said, my father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Right. I saw a picture of Yeshua lifting up the head at that time, lifting up the heads, telling them, I'm going to die. Yeah. But my father, for all the things that you're going to do, the sending out the 12 spies, right. not believing, carrying the idol, my father will forgive you. Yeah, that's good. That's the picture I got from verse two. That's, that's very, great. that's wow. very, very good. Yeah, the head by head is Golgotha. It's the same root as Golgotha. No, skull by skull. Yeah, skull. That is skull. Golgotha. Lift up the head is uh, a two at rosh. Well, head is uh, rosh. yeah, rosh. Yeah, rosh. yeah. The Golgotha is yeah. Gol Golaten. La Gol Golaten. Right. It, and it's spelled uh, Lamet Gimel Lamet Gimel Lamet Gimel Lamet Gimel Lamet. A tet, pet, no tet, tet. Tom, Tom, no, Sophie. Tom, Tom, yeah, right. Mem, Sophie. No, Mem. That's that's the head to head. Oh well, that would be uh yeah the plural. Yeah, the I am. And it's the same word that he uses for. The place where he was crucified. Correct. Where he says, count them skull by skull. Yeah, very good. And so, what we see in the census is the father is lifting the heads of Yeshua, Yeshua lifting the heads of those believers at, at skull by skull. And, yeah. and that, that brings me then to my point which is this, he says, take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel. Again, who is Israel? It's the mixed multitude, it's believers. 
You're not Israel because you're Jewish. You're not Israel because you live in the land of Israel today. You're Israel, your spiritual Israel, and Paul refers to this in Galatians chapter 6. He calls us all spiritual Israel. Okay, so you are Israel if you're a believer. He's kind of picky. He says by family, by father, yeah. by household. Right. So no. you're not just going to go in by the chin chin chin. No, no, let me explain that now too in Roman numeral three. The census teaches about God's family. Okay. All right. And uh <laughs> And in letter A, it starts with B'nai Israel in verse 2. Okay? Well, B'nai Israel is the sons of Israel. Now, this isn't uh, Ben. The Hebrew word for son, this is my son, is Ben. Okay? That's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is benai or benai. Okay, benai means all of us, sons, daughters. It's just called sons. And this is interesting because when it comes to the tzitzit, it, it says benai Israel. And, and the rabbis miss that. Okay. It's all of us. Men and women. Men and women. Yeah, absolutely. It's like saying you guys. It's like it's saying you guys. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. If I say you guys, I'm spe obviously speaking to the women as well as the guys. And and that and we understand that. And that's the same thing here. It's understood. Bene is all of us. B'nai Israel. If you're Israel, if you're a believer, that's who I'm talking to. So it starts there, B'nai Israel, and then B, he goes on and he says, um, uh, he says, let me see here. He, he, uh, in B is Mate, uh, which is the 12 tribes. So which tribe? Okay. So, and we find this in, in verse 4. Uh, okay. Mata or Mate, Mata. Okay. He says, with you, moreover, there should be a man from each mata, each tribe. Okay? And then in C, we go back up to verse 2, and he says, take a census of all the congregation of the sons of Israel by their families, mishpaha. Mishpaha is family in Hebrew. Okay? So, so he's he's starting with the nation, and then he's going all the way down in the different divisions, and he ends up in verse four. Moreover, uh, there shall be a man from each tribe, each one uh, head of his father's household, and this is Beit Av. This is what it is in the Hebrew: Beit Av, house of my father. Or my father's household is what we would call it. So he goes from the nation. So he's saying, I'm going to take a census. So God doesn't lose one of us that he's been given. And this is pointed out here because he, he numbers the entire congregation, the nation. He numbers the tribes. Each tribe is numbered. The each family, and then each, that's extended family, and then each immediate family, right, right, right down to the individual. Sharon? Just, um, there's a whole lot of thoughts going around in my mind, um, and we know that numbering 
the fighting force is 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 against Torah. I mean, we learned that from David and from other right. other. Um, but here, God um, initiates this process, right. and somehow the numbering death is part of it because when David did it, um, people had to die. Yeah. So um, I'm just I'm trying to get my head around this. Yeah. Well, remember what I was mentioning earlier about the motive in the numbering. If you're numbering so that your security comes from the numbers or your self-worth comes from the numbers or anything like that, then it's it's misappropriated counting. If you count uh, because you're going to have an O-neg, you need to know how many chairs to set up. That's a different story. Uh, because you're not counting there for the for the sake of of uh, pride or self righteousness or any well, like counting the IDF, you know, the fighting force of Israel. Yeah. So the counting Israel, Israel's getting onto thin ice now because they're boasting in the IDF these days. I know, I know. Very thin um, ice. And I, and I pray for the IDF. Yeah. Um, fine. But um, anyway, this notion of counting the fighting force and it kind of deserves a death sentence in some degree. Yeah, well, that's what came upon uh, David and the people of Israel in those in his day. Yes. So severely I, reprimanded. I'm just trying to figure this all out. Um, yeah, the way, like I said, the way that I deal with it is I go back to the motive behind it. Uh, there's, I'm sure there's more to it, but that keeps us pretty straight when we, if our motive is correct in counting, um, you know, I think you're on safe ground. Um, but, but a question, yeah. so death did not ensue on this first census, this first counting. Right. And what was it that uh, prevented that? Well, the Lord commanded Moses to take this census. Right, right. He command David to. David just did it because he wanted to see if his, his army was large enough to take on the other army. Okay. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So he was putting his trust in horses and chariots. Okay. Not in the Lord. And and like I was saying earlier, that's what pastors get into when they count the numbers in their congregation. We're putting our trust in the numbers that, okay, we're going to have enough money coming in. We're going to fill the seats. I'm going to look like a hero. It, everything's good. And and th that's a bad motive. Yeah. Count. You see what I'm saying? God doesn't want us doing that. Because when pastors count, they count everything that moves. <laughs> the mouse runs across, it gets counted. <laughs> you know, because we're so desperate for success. And our success is going to come from the Lord or it's not coming. Yes. And, and furthermore, we don't even know how to measure success. We're not smart enough. We measure success by the craziest standards that really don't mean much. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's the issue, in my opinion, with with numbering, because like I said, Israel has, has, has had nine censuses in their history, and there's going to be a tenth one in the millennial reign that the Lord has ordered. Hmm. To me, it, 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 it tells me that he knows his people. He knows where you're at, where you belong. 
he's got it down. I like that. Um, where does it mention the census and the millennial reign? I'd like that's to look. In, it's in Jeremiah 33, 13. Okay. Thank you. Kent. Um means nation. So I'm Yisrael Chai. Uh, it's, it means nation. Uh, yeah, people, right. Yeah. Um, uh, also, I, I noticed that you seem to place a lot of importance in earthly names. I mean, the names that we have on earth. And I really don't, I, I just disagree with that philosophy. I mean, it's what? past Pastor Bruce or Biker Bruce, right? I mean, forget the name. What's important is you're the pastor, you're the grandpa, you're the you're the dad. That's what's important. Yeah, I would agree with that. But there is a lot in a name. I mean, when you read the names in the Bibles and you get into what they mean, there you can't argue. There's a lot there, and uh, I don't yeah. know exactly what it means in its entirety but like i was saying earlier i i'm i'm still kind of asking the question does the name shape the character of the person or does the character dictate the name because there's a lot of names are really i'm learning very important i wish i known this actually when my kids were being born because i i might have named uh pick some different names because if I thought that their name was going to kind of uh, prophesy their character, I would have, I would have been much more uh, scrutinizing in picking a name. Now I trust that God gave us the names for our kids and the, the names of my kids match them perfectly. I mean, what can I tell you? It's it, it it's pretty good, but uh, there's a lot in the name. That's one reason I think we need to. The Lord asks us the question in Proverbs: "You know my name, or do you, or you know my son's name?" And the answer to that question is no. We don't. We don't. We still don't know the father's name, really. Okay. Uh, we've got some educated guesses, but we're not proof positive and Yeshua I mean we've just really learned that in recent years so uh, God is bringing forth revelation but that's why I say you know even for us in the Messianic we need to be using the name Yeshua not Jesus and 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 I understand we got saved under the name Jesus I understand that and if you're talking to somebody out on the street, you've got to bring Jesus into the into the mix because Yeshua, they don't even know who you're talking about. Right. But um, but for us here in our congregation, we need to pray in the name of Yeshua. That's what we believe his name is. And uh, and if we believe that, then we need to use his name. You know, you don't use uh you don't use nicknames for people unless they give you permission because it's, it's really, it's just, it's, you have to earn the right to use a nickname. Does that make sense? So it's, uh, I think that that carries over into the spirit realm as well for us. Well, All right. It could be like Johnny Cash. Just call me Sue. Yeah. Or the man in black. Yeah. I prefer the man in black. <laughs> huh? Isn't that his parents called him Sue? Yeah, that's what the song is all about. I don't know if it comes out of any truism or not, but we're getting a new name. We get, <laughs> we are getting a new name. Now that is, that also points to the the validity and the importance of names. You're getting a new name when you get to heaven. So why is that? If they're not important, they are important. I don't think we understand the full import at this point, but they're important. 
And the word is very clear. You're getting a new name in heaven. That's awesome. I think. You know, hopefully it'll be a name I can pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as names go, <clears throat> would there be names that would be classified as bad or ungodly or like my name is Frank. So, you know, that must mean that I, I should be blunt or well that's like that. well that's an English thing. I I don't know what I don't know the etymology of the name Frank. Do you? Etymology is the the uh the meaning of it? The progression it's... of the name, the evolution of the name. I just thought it meant when I speak, I should just speak directly. That's what I well, I think, I, don't, I think that would be an oversimplification, but um, well, what is do? it? Kathleen's got the meaning of your name right here. I looked it up. It says the name Frank is German, English, or French origin and means free or French men serving as a diminutive of Francis and Franklin. This liberating title may sound a bit formal for baby, but a cute nickname like Frankie. <laughs> makes it ideal for adorable little ones, but it means free. I like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. well, that's so that's the etymology of your name. And and I do have French in my ancestry. Well, there you have. <laughs> I mean, even their money are, are the Franks. Yeah. True. Right. I don't have any Franks. Well, you better get some. <laughs> I have. <laughs> I have one, but you don't talk to me. Cash in some of those uh, Iraqi din 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 dinars and get some francs. I'd like to, but you know what? They don't seem to move. They're not going anywhere. I know. Oh well. So yeah, names. Uh, my name is the Celtic version, Bruce, for found in the brushwood thicket, which is the same as Moses. Found in the brushwood thicket. Found in the reeds. So what does that mean? I don't know, but it's better than Bruce the hairdresser. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I really came out with that song when I was like in high school or something. I had to learn to fight because of my name. My name got me in a lot of trouble. Well, what can you do, right? Okay, Roman numeral four. Talk about the redemption of the firstborn. This is in Numbers 340. And most of us here know about the redemption, so I'm just going to uh, go over it real quick. It's very interesting because originally, see, the firstborn son was designated to be a priest. Period. God, somewhere along the line, and we read about it here in Numbers 3. He relents on that, and he says, you know what? I'm going to let you keep your firstborn, but you're going to have to ransom them because I'm going to, I'm going to take the whole tribe of Levi for myself and give you back your firstborn. That's basically what's happening here, Okay. That's why he takes the count of the Levites, and it's 22,273, but now you're going to have to ransom the 273 because it's an even trade across, but now it's, it's uh, you have a, not an even exchange there, if you will, okay? So the redemption of the firstborn, in other words, you buy back your firstborn. And you do it with the shekel, the uh, five shekels in verse 47 of the temple sanctuary. The best we came up with on that is with the equivalent in our currency today is about $50. And so when we first learned this, uh, somebody when we first were going through the Torah study, somebody asked me this question, what is the ransom of the firstborn? And I didn't really know, because, you know, in the in the church, you never, 
that's a non-issue. You, you never hear about that. And so I studied it and uh, came back and said, well, you know, basically this is what was trans transpiring. They were ransoming the, the firstborn, uh, buying them back uh, from the Lord so that they could live their life outside the priesthood. Because if you're called to the priesthood and then you don't enter it, where does that leave you in your standing with God? Not in a good place. And how many firstborns in our society are not serving the Lord? Most. So, of course, you don't want you don't want that to come upon your firstborn child, or even upon yourself if you're the firstborn. How many firstborns do we have in this room right now? We we have more than half the people here are firstborn, which is very interesting. So. God said you can redeem the firstborn, and the way you do it is by bringing uh, approximately $50 to the sanctuary as an offering for the firstborn, as a ransom. So I had Deanna do some homework to find out, uh, to try to come up with a figure of what the sanctuary, what five sanctuary shekels was, was worth today, and the best she came back with was $50. So we just went with it. So we, uh, I taught on it, and, and um, probably most of the people in our congregation ransomed the firstborn, their firstborn. And then somebody at, the, at, at a subsequent tour study said, well, can we do this second and third and fourth child? I said, well, I don't know. It doesn't talk about that. Uh, but I said it couldn't hurt. So we we did all three of our kids. I mean, it, just an offer. It, just an offer. I mean, it's 150 bucks. It, it, if that brings blessing to their life somehow that I don't understand, it, it's worth it to me. You know what I'm saying? So we did all three of our kids. Now we had praise reports. We had some praise reports come in. I don't remember what they were now. It's been a long time. But we had praise reports that came in concerning the, the firstborn after they were ransomed. And there was enough praise reports that it got our attention. We went, okay, there's something here. We've never had a praise report for a second, third, or fourth child. So does that mean anything? I don't know. But uh, like I said, we did it anyway, just uh, to err on the side of safety, if you will, or whatever. Um, but definitely the firstborn was to be ransomed. So people, when they come to me now, I just say, look, just do a, an offering. This is above your tithe. It's not your tithe. Above your offering, $50, right on the, in the memo on your check, uh, ransom for the firstborn. And then leave it with God. Um, for us now, today, in our society, that's that's probably the best you can do. Um, and like I said, we had enough praise reports come in from that that we we felt that there was something to it. Um, so, uh, so every year when we go through the Torah study, we kind of teach on that and, and we bring that up. That firstborn of your father or firstborn of your mother? We did, well, we did firstborn period. Technically, this is the firstborn son. Uh, and I don't think the father or mother even enter into the picture here. It's the, womb. it's the first child that opens the womb. And of course, he gets in. That was true for the cattle and everything else. And it, it really becomes, you know, Yeshua is called the firstborn from the dead. I mean, the firstborn concept with with the Lord is a big concept in the in the Bible. But Jacob had four firstborn from the mother, but he only had one from mothers. Yes, but he only had one. Well, Rachel was a legal wife. She wasn't a concubine. She was second. She was the second, but she was still a wife. She was the wife, but she wasn't the first. No, I understand that. Um, and she wasn't buried with him. 
No, I know. And and she didn't have the predominant tribes with her either. She didn't have the predominant tribe. She had the smallest tribe, uh, uh, Benjamin. And and who else was uh, her son? Joseph. Joseph. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. So, including Judah, who emerges at the, to the, the top. Oh, I know. She had half the tribe. Yeah. And she's the one that's buried at uh, Makpala, uh with with the patriarch, of the matriarch, not Rachel. So we here, we just went with, um, because even, even Jacob acknowledges Reuben as his firstborn. He is the firstborn for his family line. Yeah. And I think that that's one reason we go down through this B'nai Israel, uh, Matav, Mishpacha, Beit Av, because your firstborn comes right down to your father's household, right? So that's how you determine it. And, and so at Shiloh, we also did firstborn females. You can just take it away whenever the father wants. What do you mean? Uh, uh, Isaac did that with Jacob and Esau. You, you use the microphone, you can. It doesn't really matter if you are the firstborn of your parent because uh, the father could say, no, you committed this sin, so I'm skipping you. And, and you you killed these people, and I really don't like you and your brother, so I'm going to skip you and your brother, and I'm going to go down to my fourthborn, which is Judah. Yeah. And Isaac did that. Uh, with, with Esau Jacob and was Esau. born first. Yeah. But Jacob got the first book. Yeah. Almost all of them. And like I was saying, there's a lot to the firstborn that we don't understand. Uh, the ransoming of the firstborn, I think we understand part of that. Like I was saying, but like you said, Esau was the firstborn. Uh, Cain and Abel. Cain was the firstborn. So there, there's a dynamic in there that we don't quite comprehend. See? So, again, so what we have to take the word in our generation for the best that we understand and then just do the best we know to do. But we did that with Easter and Christmas. Look at the best we got into. I understand that, but you got into that because you weren't studying. You were just listening to. I was listening to my passion. Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, and he said, do Christmas. I know. I know. And, and that's on the pastors. I mean, there is a scathing rebuke against pastors in Malachi chapter one. I mean, he just. There's them a new one. You know, <clears throat> to whom much is given, much more is required. And that's why I try to be very diligent now in uh I don't I don't parrot what I hear. If I hear something, I study it. Does it doesn't does it, does it, does it, does it, does it, and when I'm the scripture say study? For yourself, yeah, to be self approved, not to listen to what you have to study say. to show yourself approved. But pastors and teachers, they have a special role because a teacher has the ability to see things in the word that other people don't see. That's the gift of teaching. That's the gift of of pastoring. You're able to see things that maybe a lot of other people don't see. So you can take it from there, put it into something that's digestible, and then feed the sheep. So there is a place for pastors and teachers, obviously. They're part of the fivefold ministry. What's their pur purpose? Well, they're gifted to be able to find things in the Word um, 
and be able to bring those to the people and introduce them to the people. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has a, a gift for teaching. That's one of the big problems in our society today with homeschoolers, in my opinion. Many people are homeschooling that are not teachers. And guess what? Their kids aren't learning. Because you need a teacher. You need somebody that knows how to teach. You know, I've, I've shared, uh, even with our, invest, our investments in, in Bitcoin, I was exposed to Bitcoin when it was $4 a piece. It's now $70,000 a piece, gone up 9 million percent. I al almost bought $100 worth at $4. But you can I, buy it. I didn't buy it, so I guess I might have friends. But uh, <laughs> but here's the here's the here's the point that I want to make. The reason I didn't buy it is because the person sharing with me couldn't teach me the concept of it. I couldn't get it. I said, "Well, show me one." Well, they're 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 digital. They, you 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 don't put them in your pocket. And I struggled with that. I said, what do you mean? And he couldn't teach me. See, and I felt like, well, I lost out. If I bought $100 of Bitcoin at $4 a piece, I'd be a billionaire today. Simple as that. I mean, and I, and I didn't do it because he couldn't teach me. Well, then I became a believer. And when I was a believer, my pastors didn't teach me. That's not all on them. I I have always studied since day one because I, I'm just a student type person. But when I when we came to faith, we're coming out of the bike scene and we go to Chuck Smith's church, who is one of the most famous pastors in the world. And he's saying what he's saying, and who am I to challenge that? I mean, I don't know anything. So when he says it, I just embrace it. He says, we, we go to church on Sundays. Okay, everyone goes to church on Sundays. I, I've got that down, yeah. And then it's it becomes so much a part of your life, you don't check it out until the Lord brings it to your the forefront of your mind. And you go, hey, why aren't we doing Shabbat? Why are we doing Sunday? <clears throat> and then you start questioning. See, and that so it's it's not all on the pastors, but I wish the pastors had had that revelation or at the very least studied that out because that's been a question forever. The Bible never talks about Sunday worship. It talks about Shabbat. So it would seem to me, why not ask the question, hey, what about Shabbat? We had a new couple down in, in Redland just, well, they've been there for a month or so now. But same, they have the same story as every one of us. She started doing some research and saying, well, why, are, why don't we do Shabbat? Where, where's Sunday? And they start asking questions. And I said, you have the same story that every person in this room has. We started questioning the authorities in our life and realizing that they didn't have all the answers that we thought they had. So very important to really, uh, that's one of the things I really appreciate about you, Marie, you check these things out. And and uh, and it doesn't throw your faith off. That's another thing. A lot of people have a hard time really delving deeply into the Bible because it, it challenges their faith. This guy I was talking about on the radio yesterday said, you know, the dinosaurs aren't really talked about in the Bible, but I've taught you differently. In the Hebrew, they're they're mentioned. 
the giant lizards, giant reptiles. That's a dinosaur. The word dinosaur isn't used, but giant reptile. Hello, that that pretty well says it all. And yet he doesn't, he's on the Glenn Beck show. I mean, that's a pretty big platform. And here he's, this is what he's saying. I told Kath, I said, well, I agree with a lot of what he's saying, but he doesn't know the Hebrew at all. And yet how many people took that, that teaching and have embraced it? You see what I'm saying? So you want to, that's why I'm always saying, don't believe anything I tell you, check it out. And I, and I encourage you to do that because I don't bring anything to you until I've checked it out. And I feel comfortable with it. And once I feel comfortable, I'm willing to present it to you and then say, okay, you know, have I missed anything? Check it out. See if I'm looking at this right or not. Because it's very easy to skew your, your point of view, but not... Let me move on here. Let's finish it right here. Verse five, the three camps, or Roman, Roman numeral five, three camps and ascending spheres of holiness. We saw this in Numbers 151, okay, through 53. Let me read this to you. It says, so when the tabernacle is to set out, the Levites shall take it down. And when the tabernacle encamps, the Levites shall set it up. But the layman who comes near shall be put to death. So the, unless you're a Levite, you, you couldn't get near the tabernacle. Even if it was torn down, you would die if you touched it. So the son, in verse 52, the sons of Israel shall camp each man by his own camp and each man by his own standard, according to their armies. But the Levites shall camp around the tabernacle of the testimony. Now listen to this. So that there will be no wrath on the congregation of the sons of Israel. So what is this talking about? You've got your tabernacle in the middle, and then you have the Levites camped around that, and then the tribes of, of uh, Israel, the other tribes of Israel, and the, the people in the camp, before they can even get close to the tabernacle, because if they get too close to the tabernacle unauthorized, they die. So God says, so that there will be no wrath on the congregation. He says they're going to have to pass through the camp of the Levite before they get near the tabernacle, and then the, it's up to the Levite to make sure that they're following the proper protocol to come closer. That's what this is all about. So what we see here is an ascending sphere of holiness. Okay? So there wasn't as much holiness required out on the fringe of the camp. In fact, we learned today that they had idols going on out there. But by the time you get in close to the tabernacle with the, the, the Levites, I doubt that there was any idols in the tents of the Levites because they would have been killed. God winked out here that all right, I'll tolerate it, but just know this, you're going you're going to be sent into exile beyond Damascus because of it. But right now, I'm going to look the other way. Okay. And that's, and that's what the book of Acts says. The book of Acts says he winks at our ignorance for a season. All of us. And it's a good thing or none of us would make it anywhere. So you come through the Levites, and then the Levites are the ones that are actually able to officiate and actually touch the curtains. You know, the, the average Israelite couldn't even touch the curtains of, of the tabernacle. I don't know about the outer ones, but I would imagine that when they withdrew the, the, the opening for the tabernacle, you would take your offering in. 
Um, we're not really sure, I don't think, it, in the tabernacle if the people dropped their offering off with the priest at the at the door and then he took it in or whether they took it in. We know in temple times, they took it in to the slaughter pen and they had to slaughter it themselves. But we also know that the glory of the second temple wasn't anywhere near what it was before. So without the glory there, the parameters aren't quite as distinctive or rigid. So what we have here in letter A is we have this these ascending spheres. You have the tabernacle, which is the divine presence. Okay? And then in B, then you have the, the Levites. They're camped around the tabernacle. And then in letter C, you have the Israelites who are camped around the Levites. So our goal for each of us, in my opinion, because we are all a, a uh, royal priesthood, a holy nation, right? So if we are a royal priesthood, we should all be striving to, to be in that camp of the Levites. And what that means is we have to get rid of the things that would keep us out of it. Maria. When they were settled in, who was the one that picked out the number one uh, tribe for that section? Like the section on the east, it was Judah. The section on the south was Reuben. The section on the on the west I think, was Ephraim. I think God picked it. I think that's just, he told Moses, this is how I want the people camped, and this is what's happening. <laughs> you have another answer? Dead silence. You have another answer? Well, and, and it's also interesting because we, we do know from the, uh, from the censuses that were taken, we know that the larger tribes uh, and the smaller tribes were formed in such a way that from an aerial view, as the as the entourage. Yeah. No. No. Jewish writings in the Tanakh and several other places said it was a square. The Christians yeah. are the ones that are imposing a uh, well, uh, that that could be. You can't. There's no way. I sat down and I I tried to make a cross and with a camp. They're gonna have to be on a plane as big as Montana to have the tribe going that way and the tribe going and then the long one on the no, no cross. No cross. <laughs> well, I have to defer to you because I've never sat down and done the math. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, no cross. Okay. I'm good with that. <laughs> And the, way, and the way that they picked Judah and, and the the ones who are supposed to be in command of that section yeah. was in the blessing of of uh, I of uh, Isaac that he when he gave them the blessing not Isaac, Jacob Jacob when he blessed uh, the son those four if you look at the blessing it has an extra blessing. To make them the head of that particular site. You can look up the blessing for yourself. Thank you. I did. Is that in Genesis 49? Just, yeah. I might just do that. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like the one on the west, Judah is the head, right? Yeah. Judah is the lion. He's the number one. Right. The uh, Zebulon was the one with the money, and Issachar was the one that taught. So if you look at the how God placed them, the leader, the one who teaches Torah, and the one who supplies the church. Okay. The one on the way. So like the pastor. Sharon. Sharon. Last one, Sharon. Sorry, 
um, Maria, I love you, um, but I would lovingly um, disagree with you because um, some of the Jewish scholars say that, okay, when the tribes were lined up to the east, they would not go beyond what the sanctuary, um, they would line up with the sanctuary. In other words, they had to go directly east. They could not uh, get bigger or enlarge. And the ones that went west had to go directly west from the sanctuary. The sanctuary was the focal point. And then the ones that went north and south, the same. And I, I, that seems to, um, the other thing, it's, it's a very minute thing is, okay, how do the Israelites relieve themselves? They had to go out beyond um, the encampments um, and dig a hole and, and do what they needed to do. If it was a huge square, the people on the innermost spaces would have, especially with children, you know, I can't walk that far. You know, it's just like, I gotta go. And- um, so It would have been six miles. Yes, yes. So I-, I Maria, I love you, but I, I, I think- About a pregnant woman. Yeah. Like exactly. Exactly. Um, Maybe you guys can get together and study together and give me the answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry. No, that's good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, one of the things I love about the Midrash, I don't have time to sit down and 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 do every detail. It, you just can't do it. It's too much. So I appreciate it. Like like I said, I didn't. I've never done the math. So um, I just go, okay. I, I hear this, and I go, all right. Uh, you know, hopefully they've done their homework. <laughs> so you know, so but everyone studies out different things, and then we put our heads together, and we we come up with a better picture. All right, guys, that's our tour study for today. Thanks for tuning in.